Today I present the second part of my ongoing series presenting the proposed documents for the Second Vatican Council. These documents were prepared by Cardinal Ottoviani at the request of John XXIII and were immediately rejected by the revolutionaries at the Council. The documents would be all but forgotten in the dustbin of history until a few years ago when they were uncovered and translated by a scholar. They strike me as being much more unambiguously Catholic than what we received. For example, this document, called On the Christian Moral Order, talks about sin, the need for penance, and the need to make frequent confession, among other topics. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Draft of a Dogmatic Constitution on the Christian Moral Order Chapter 1 The Foundation of the Christian Moral Order 1. The Objective Character of the Moral Order When the infinitely good and infinitely holy God revealed the mystery of his holiness and love in the work of creation and redemption, he at the same time showed men the way of love and holiness. For this reason, in accord with the Apostle's statement, This is the will of God, your sanctification, see 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, the Second Vatican Council solemnly professes that there is an ordering, ordinatio, of the same infinitely good and infinitely holy God by which to measure the rightness and wrongness of human acts. This ordering of divine wisdom which men share by knowledge becomes the rule and norm of holiness for them, so that, as sacred scripture teaches, they may be holy as God himself is holy. Observing this moral order with the help of God, without which no one can serve the divine will, man conforms his will to the will of God, and, sharing in the law of liberty, he not only becomes a faithful servant of God, but also shares in that freedom of the children of God in virtue of which, freed from the slavery of sin, he can tend towards his ultimate end, which in this economy of salvation is God himself, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, to be possessed in heaven by contemplation and by love. The moral order, therefore, is not a fiction of the human mind, but really exists, just as the will of God, infinitely wise, good, and holy, really exists. 2. An Absolute Moral Order The moral order, furthermore, is absolute. That is, it is valid always and everywhere, independently of circumstances, although in various ways and degrees. For it proceeds from the ordering of God who, because of his infinite holiness, necessarily loves the good and hates the evil, and in whom there is no alteration or shadow of change, it also is related to a single and absolutely fixed goal which consists in this, that man remains inseparably linked with God. The moral order must be said to be absolute also with regard to its fundamental norms, which do not depend on changeable circumstances, but radically inhere in God himself, supreme holiness and eternal wisdom, and it establishes the relationships that must necessarily exist both among rational creatures themselves and especially between rational creatures and their creator. In its own way, this order is also absolute in those matters which, although not necessary in themselves, God in this economy of salvation has, by his own sovereignty, willed immutably to establish, although he could have established things differently. Nor is it to be said to be absolute only with regard to commands and prohibitions, but also with regard to divine counsels, which must be held in high honor by all even if all are not required to observe them. For this reason, despite the different aspects which the divine order once had in the earthly paradise, which it now has here on earth in the fallen and redeemed human race, and which it will have finally in heaven, and despite also the various applications of norms in various circumstances of life, the moral order must not be said to be relative in any way, and the Holy Synod rejects any teaching in which its absolute validity is denied either in whole or in any of its essential parts. 3. God the Guardian, Judge and Vindicator of the Moral Order God, who rules the whole world by his wisdom, gave man the law of freedom, so that, by following the ordering of his Creator and Redeemer, which he shares by nature and grace, he might attain true virtue and true dignity. Thus the holiness of God and the good of man himself immutably require that his every free activity be governed by the eternal law. 
Not only, therefore, is God the author and end of the moral order, he is and must necessarily be also its guardian, judge, and vindicator, in accordance with what the fathers of the First Vatican Council taught about the providence with which God guards and governs all the things which he created. 4. The Twofold Manifestation of the Moral Order the Holy Synod also teaches and professes that the moral order is made manifest to creatures in two ways. The first is through the natural law, insofar, that is, as the will of God by which we are commanded to be holy, as he himself is holy, becomes known through the natural light of reason, as it reflects upon human nature and its tendencies and essential relationships, especially with its creator. The second is through the revelation of God shared in by the supernatural light of faith, by which the natural law is confirmed and perfected, and, what is more important, by which that divine law becomes known by which God's merciful will is proper to the economy of salvation. For what the apostle attested concerning the Gentiles, namely, that although they do not have the law of Moses, they, unless their hearts are darkened, naturally do what the law requires. See Romans chapter 1 verses 21 to 22 and chapter 2 verse 14 is also proved by sound reason and common experience for in obvious common and daily circumstances men of sound judgment even if uneducated spontaneously as it were and led by some innate inclination judge and act about what is right and allowed what is wrong and forbidden but by revelation god has made it possible that all the children of Adam, wretchedly darkened and weakened by the sin of their first parent in their knowledge and performance of morality, can know the natural law easily, with firm certainty, and with no mixture of error. Speaking finally through his son, who did not come to abolish but to fulfill the precepts of the Decalogue, which were naturally, although imperfectly, known to the Gentiles, he restored, articulated, perfected, and raised the natural law to a higher order. There is then no opposition between the natural law and the law of the gospel. The natural law is contained and perfected in the gospel's law. For this reason also the magisterium of the church, to which Christ entrusted the deposit of faith, and to which through the paraclete he handed over all the truth, see John chapter 16 verse 13, has the right and the duty authoritatively to explain and definitively to interpret the natural law too. And when the common good of the church demands it, it also has the right and the duty to issue, not without the help of the Holy Spirit, disciplinary decrees which provide determinate solutions to controversies over obscure issues. 5. The Content of the Moral Order As by Christ's grace it appears in the law of the gospel, the moral order contains all that man needs in order simply and more easily to obtain eternal life that is, what is required, forbidden, permitted, or counseled. All of which Christ the Lord summarized in those two supreme commandments, love God and love of neighbor. Indeed, perfecting the law of the Old Testament by the new commandment by which the faithful are to be recognized as true disciples of Christ, see John chapter 13 verse 34 and John chapter 15 verse 12, he desired that they should love all men, including their enemies. See Luke chapter 19 verse 18 and Matthew chapter 5 verse 43. And indeed with the same love with which he loved them. This love by which we love God above all and love all men for God's sake fulfills, as the Lord himself attested. See Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 to 48. That divine precept which reads, Be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. See Matthew chapter 5 verse 48 and displays to all the baptized the royal and surpassing way to acquire perfection. A splendid witness and praising of the law of grace and charity is that special way of for acquiring Christian perfection, by which believers, called by God to embrace the keeping of the evangelical counsels, attempt to follow as closely as possible, and to imitate as completely as possible the Christ who is poor, chaste, and obedient unto death. The sacred synod therefore testifies that the keeping of the counsels recommended by the divine creator is a precious ornament and embellishment of the bride of Christ. 6. Errors are rejected. The sacred synod rejoices over the great number of children of the church who, by observing the moral order and the law of the gospel, cling with all their hearts to God and to his only begotten Son. It grieves, however, that many people are transgressing the divine law, more from weakness than from wickedness, 
though rarely without grave guilt. It notes with great horror that errors are being spread everywhere, errors that open the way to perdition and close the gate of salvation. There are those who deny a personal God, and so deprive the natural law of its foundation. There are those who, repudiating the mission of Christ, reject the law of the gospel. There are those who rely only on human principles in explaining the moral order, and therefore rob it of its genuine and ultimate obligation and sanction. There are those who deny that the intellect can enjoy true certitude in moral matters. There are those who maintain that the moral law is subject to changes and to evolution, even in fundamental matters. There are those who teach that the human person has been endowed with so exalted a dignity that he is not subject to any law imposed upon him by God or by the church or teach that he can embrace and fulfill the Christian law by his own powers without the help of grace. There are those who claim that the moral law has no validity except by an agreement that proceeds either from the collectivity or from the totality. Whether this is considered to be the majority of the citizens, or the state, or the people, or the race, or the nation, or a faction, or a social class. There are also those who think that the moral law proceeds merely from naked, crass, and brutal power, and who put this ideology of theirs into practice. Although all these people disagree among themselves on many matters, they have it in common that, by their views, they close the gate of the kingdom of heaven and do not allow others to enter. See Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. Creeping error has many colors and many heads, but the truth which will set us free, see John chapter 8, thir verse 32, is one as Christ is one. But the same thing that the founder of the church once had testified about himself, he can today profess to the church before the world. I came in the name of my father, and you do not accept me. Yet if another comes in his own name, you will accept him. See John chapter 5, verse 43. Chapter 2, Christian Conscience. 7. The Notion of Conscience. It is through the conscience of individuals that the Christian moral order, about which believers are taught by the help of reason and revelation, directs and leads them in practical judgments about the rightness of their actions. Conscience, if it be rightly formed, makes clear to them at the moment of choice what God's will requires be judged and done. Since the will of God becomes clearer to us through the teaching of Christ and the magisterium of the church, illumined by the Holy Spirit, conscience is, as it were, the herald of God, of Christ and of the church. And furthermore, since the whole life of Christians, with regard to morality, is subject to the conscience of individuals, is governed and led by its dictates, that saying of Christ can also be accommodated to conscience. The lamp of your body is your eye. When your eye is sound, then your whole body is filled with light. See Luke chapter 11, verse 34. 8. Proper Formation of Conscience The following words of Christ can equally be accommodated to conscience. If your eye is bad, then your body is in darkness. Take care, then, that the light in you not become darkness. See Luke chapter 11, chapter 11 verses 34 to 35. These words reveal how important it is that careful diligence be given to the right formation of conscience, for without a right formation of conscience, rightness of life cannot be had. Care must be taken, first, that conscience be correct or prudently formed, serious, sincere, and true, but it will not tr be true simply because it is formed in accord with the views or personal persuasion of individuals, but because it is in harmony with norms established by God, as they really are and thus discloses to us God's will, as clearly expressed in the will, teaching, and life of Jesus Christ. In forming his conscience, therefore, man is not autonomous, but subject to the will of God. Nor should anyone dare to say that the will of God is to be adapted to the views of men, since quite the contrary, man is to be adapted to God. 9. Erroneous Conscience The fundamental principle that the norm for forming conscience is the objective moral order and not merely subjective persuasion, is not at all abandoned in the case of a malformed conscience. For even a believer can err in forming his conscience. But even with respect to someone in error, the dictate of an erroneous conscience does not change the objective moral order, just as it also does not abolish the bond by which an erring person is bound to that order, even if he may perhaps be without guilt in performing the error his conscience falsely dictates. 
In a case of an error committed in good faith, therefore, a man does not at all become in the form of conscience a source and norm of morality. Indeed, that a man can not only can but even must follow his erroneous conscience does not arise from his subjective persuasion but from the objective moral order itself, which seriously prohibits the will to sin that a man displays in his very refusal to follow his conscience, even when it is an error. That is why the apostolic, the apostle said of the conscience, quote, whatever is not from faith is sin. See Romans chapter 14, verse 23. This shows how great for conscience is the force and validity of the objective order. However, it is apprehended. Anyone who errs in good faith about objective rightness remains free from guilt as long as that persuasion lasts without guilt. But since that inculpable error cannot be without some harm to the one in error himself or to the community, indeed, such harm can sometimes be considerable. Christians cannot remain indifferent to the formation of a right conscience in others. 10. The Pseudo-Autonomy of Conscience If even a conscience that is erroneous in good faith does not remove the subjection and subordination of conscience to the laws contained in the objective order, much less can it be taken away by the wicked attempt of those who knowingly and willingly attempt to subtract themselves from that order, ineptly appealing to the right, freedom, and dignity of their own conscience. For such a right, such a freedom, such a dignity does not exist in human nature, nor in man as a person, even if many people, led by false principles and ideologies, may claim the contrary, not without serious harm to souls. The true freedom of the children of God and the true dignity of the created person are only had in free dependence on God. 11. Conscience marked by Christ's truth and love. Finally, the sacred synod teaches that in the direction of conscience, not only the truth but also Christian love must be kept in mind. For knowledge without love, says the apostle, puffs up but does not build up. See 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. That is why after we have striven with all our might to make our brothers aware of their error, not only must love guide our judgment of those who err in good faith and transgress God's law, but must also take account of those who mistakenly see sin where there is no sin, lest we be a scandal to them, by our example leading them to things they mistakenly think are sins. For true love demands that we cannot at all convince our brothers of their error. We always, so long of course as the rights of truth, justice, and the common good are preserved, avoid anything that would prevent their being won by Christ, who also died for them. An authentic Christian conscience must always be marked by Christ's truth and love. Chapter 3 Ethical Subjectivism and Relativism 12. The Gospel Law and Particular Conditions The fundamental objections of the law of the gospel in part rest upon immutable human nature itself. In part, however, insofar as they exceed the obligations of the natural law, they inhere in the proper character of the supernatural order established by the Divine Redeemer. And for that reason, these obligations have force wherever and in whatever conditions a Christian may find himself. Although human action is necessarily singular, subject to the conditions of time and place, nevertheless, the very character of the law of the gospel demands that it be this law which dictates to individual consciences what they should decide in individual cases and in various circumstances. If, therefore, the divine legislator has commanded or forbidden something, it may never become a matter of deliberation. Rather, the words of the early martyrs remain valid. In so just a matter, no deliberation is needed. But if in a particular case it is not clear that a universal law, transcending circumstances, must be applied in order to judge the rightness of an action, the virtue of prudence is most necessary, for this virtue considers not only universals but also particulars, so as to determine what is and is not permitted from an accurate and diligent consideration of the end and of the means. 13. The Necessary Knowledge of Individual Cases this diligent inquiry demands that conscience be rightly formed not only about the law of the gospel and its obligations, but also about the things that are proper to individuals. But the faithful should consider it certain that this individual diversity, which derives from differences in sex and in age, and from the various places that individuals occupy in the mystical body of Christ, is circumscribed within certain just limits and does not imply dissimilarity in human nature. For otherwise, Jesus Christ could not be through his church the Lord, head and teacher of every man, age, and condition. 
nor could he represent for everyone the supreme exemplar of all virtues. 14. False Propositions The Christian faith should therefore be aware of certain false statements that are being widely popularized today. One of these maintains that the act of conscience is not merely, or properly speaking, a dictate, but should be considered the conclusion of an intimate and immediate dialogue with God, a conversation into which no external law, no authority, no religious confession can intrude itself. Another position establishes a false opposition between God the Father and God the Legislator, suggesting that one should listen to the voice of the Father rather than to the precepts of the Legislator so that the ultimate reason for acting is not the objective right order, but some inner sense in each person by which he knows in individual circumstances what he should do, or rather, what God does not require be done. How pernicious to the salvation of souls such statements are, are we can know from their fruits, as the Savior teaches us. For from a pretext of being honest with oneself, and before God the conclusion is drawn that it is licit to do things that are seriously and universally forbidden, for example, to exchange the Catholic faith to another, to attempt divorce to procure an abortion, to refuse obedience to legitimate authority, directly to commit suicide. The faithful, therefore, should not allow themselves to be seduced by a philosophy lofty in speech, but empty and false. See Colossians uh, chapter 2, verses 4 to 8. A father who truly loves his children commands that evil things be avoided in every case. Nor is that other proposition less pernicious, that maintains that God, the reader and judge of consciences, looks only at the intention and of the fundamental attitude by which a person, generally speaking, shrinks from offending God. But the very intention of a man is not right if he neglects to investigate and to fulfill the divine will expressed in God's commandments, and to carry out the good work required by God. Otherwise, a man would not grow better or worse by his good or evil works, and everything would be good as long as a loving intention or a generally good attitude were maintained. From such behavior arises that double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, of whom James the Apostle speaks. See James chapter 1 verse 8. But he who has looked carefully into the perfect law of the liberty and has remained in it, not becoming a forgetful hearer but a doer, shall be blessed in his deed. See James chapter 1, verse 25. 15. The false statement that love is the only criterion of morality. Finally, there are people who so make love the only criterion of morality and its single norm that they think the other virtues are not important. It is true that the love by which the just love God above all things and love the neighbor because of God is greater than faith, hope, and the other virtues. See 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. It does not, however, remove the need for both these kinds of virtues, but so nourishes and fosters them that we may come to the extent of the full stature of Christ. See Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. The Holy Council therefore encourages that all the activities of the Christian faithful be done in love. See 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14. But they should not therefore make the mistake of thinking that a man acts in a Christian manner only when love is the motive or that the other virtues are unimportant, as if God crowned only an explicit act of love. For acts of the just that proceed from another proper motive or impulse can condignly meet, merit the growth of grace and of glory, not, however, without that love. Care should likewise be taken that simple people not misunderstand the statement, love and do what thou wish, and mistakenly think that only one precept, namely, thou shalt love, has to be kept in the Christian life. For such a life is reduced to some uncertain feeling of love, completely neglecting the keeping of the commandments, in contradiction of the Lord himself, who said, If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. See Matthew chapter 19, verse 17. And elsewhere, Whoever has my commandments and observes them is the one who loves me. See John chapter 14, verse 21. Chapter 4. Sin. 16. At what, in what sense the reign of sin has been destroyed? By his most holy death, our Lord Jesus Christ destroyed the reign of both sin and death. And those whom he baptized in the Spirit, he truly liberated from the lordship of sin, if they walk in the Spirit, as the Apostle testified. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed me from the law of sin and death. See Romans chapter 8, verse 2. 
Nevertheless, as long as we sojourn on earth, we can withdraw from the source of life by sin, which is transgression of the law and wickedness. See 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, and an offense against God. But while mortal sin, the friendship between God and men is destroyed, and man again becomes a child of wrath. See Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. By venial sin, into which, says the Council of Trent, we frequently fall, the warmth of love grows cold. Indeed, sometimes, especially if it is repeated, the soul is inclined towards mortal sin. 17. Mortal sin with and out of contempt. To prevent anyone from falling into error, to the harm of his immortal soul, the sacred synod teaches that mortal sin can be present even if a man does not explicitly despise or hate God. This can happen if with full advertence and full consent he embraces something that utterly opposes friendship with God, and if he abandons the means that are of themselves and absolutely necessary to reach his true end. Sinning with contempt of God, therefore, is not the same thing as sinning out of contempt for him. The extreme of such wickedness is that it makes a man like the devil, but it cannot be denied that even serious sins that do not proceed from such contempt are of their nature done with contempt of the legislator, and therefore destroys friendship with him. 18. Sins committed out of weakness. The teaching of the church is seriously opposed, therefore, by anyone who says that every sin committed under the influence of man's sensible power is always only a venial sin, nor can the opinion of those be tolerated who maintain that serious sin which they call formal sin, cannot be present except in a person who, free from all influence of the feelings, knowingly refuses to lay aside the evil habit under which he culpably labors. If these views were correct, mortal, formal, and imputable sin would scarcely ever occur. But this clearly opposes the practice of the church and the spirit by which it is ruled. For the church has always considered that those who, in the time of persecutions, denied Christ out of fear of torture, really fell and seriously sinned. And St. Peter himself bitterly wept over his guilt. See Matthew chapter 26, verse 75, and Luke chapter 22, verse 62. 19. False Psychological Theories Although serious sin gives birth to death, see James chapter 1, verse 15, and there is nothing more detestable than it, Remorse of conscience and consciousness of sin are great gifts that God gives to sinners so that they move back from their wicked way and return to the source of divine mercy. It is injurious to the divine mercy, therefore, not to distinguish between these salutary gifts and that scrupulous anxiety or those merely psychic states that are said to flow from some conflict within consciousness. Nor is remorse of conscience simply the effect of dissatisfaction or so-called frustration on the way of sin and evil. 20. The growth of the Christian in the way of justice. In order to lead a Christian life so fruitfully as to respond to Christ's desires, it is not enough to avoid sins, especially lethal ones, if the teaching of the gospel were purely negative in character, or simply a so-called ethic of prohibited actions. For it is utterly necessary that in all things we grow in love in him who is the head, Christ. See Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15. To the warmth and growth of love are especially opposed those sins that are said to be lighter, daily, venial. As far as human frailty allows it, the Christian must avoid these sins, especially those that are fully deliberate. In order to avoid venial sin and to make speedier progress in the path of the virtues, the sacred synod strongly recommends the pious use of frequent confession, which did not arise in the church without the impulse of the Holy Spirit. For by this practice, a correct self-knowledge is increased. Christian humility grows, wrong habits are rooted out, spiritual negligence and laziness are combated, the conscience is purified, the will is strengthened, a salutary direction of souls is obtained, and grace is increased by the power of the sacrament itself. 21. The Great Duty of Penance As sacred scripture attests, the life of man on earth is warfare. See Job chapter 7 verse 1. The sum of Christian warfare is not to indulge the corrupt morals of the age, but indeed constantly to oppose and resist them. Christians should therefore recognize how foreign it is to the profession of the Christian name for people, as often happens, to pursue all sort of pleasures, shrink from the labor of virtue, never refuse themselves whatever sweetly and delightfully allures the senses. For those who are of Christ have crucified their flesh with its vices and desires. See Galatians chapter 5 verse 24. It is not, therefore, a counsel, but a duty that does not belong only to those who have chosen the more perfect kind of life, but to all.
that by the power of Christ, who for us was flogged, crowned with thorns, crucified, we carry about in our bodies the dying of Jesus, so that his life may be manifest in us. See 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 to 11. Anyone who offers God sacrifices for sin by that fact professes that the supreme laws of morality are holy, acknowledges their binding force, and the right of God to punish those who violate them. The power of penance is, therefore, a salutary kind of arms used by vigorous soldiers of Christ, prepared to defend the whole moral order, and, where necessary, to restore it. If a Christian really burns with zeal for the divine law and with brotherly love, he will not only contribute by penance to the washing away of his own sins, but will also take upon him the sins of others, to be expiated by the works of penance. 22. Errors are rejected. They are seriously in error, therefore, who, because of a false quietism or naturalism of some other reason, make light of Christian penance, and they inflict harm upon the church and Christ himself, who describe penance as a secret hatred of the flesh, which once was characteristic of the Manichees, or as a perverse appetite for pain, sought for its pleasures. Chapter 5. The Natural and Supernatural Dignity of the Human Person 23. Man Made in the Image of God The dignity of the human person consists in the fact that he was made in the image and likeness of God, by his nature immediately ordered towards the Creator, and received from God the light of reason, the power of free choice, the flame of love, and dominion over bodily realities. Indeed, given to share in the divine nature, see 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, he is called to that participation in the divine sonship of Christ, because of which we are called and are children of God. See 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. This dignity of the human person is both proclaimed by the word of God and defended by the laws of the church, and only shines purely in those who, by faith, hope, and love, and by filial obedience, submit themselves to God and to God's legates. For to serve God is to reign. 24. A defense of the freedom of the will. From its beginning, the Catholic Church has strongly defended the freedom of the will against pagans and Gnostics. No less strongly, it has opposed that freedom which the Prince of the Apostles called freedom for wickedness. See 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16. Wicked and unrestrained use of the precious gift of freedom. At the Council of Trent, the same church declared that true freedom was not at all extinguished by the ruin of original sin. And although it is highly regarded also by many of our contemporaries outside the church, still today there is no less need to defend it. For one must reject certain widespread views, that either the frightful circumstances of life today, or the power of the passions and feelings, or the immense influence of modern ideologies on the mind and feelings of men, or especially the ever-increasing psychopathic diseases, are of such a nature that in today's conditions many people must be considered not only to be of diminished freedom but quite incapable of true actions, so that it is quite rare today to find people who can be said to be genuine adults in the moral order. It escapes no one that in such views not only does human freedom vanish, but with it also merit and demerit, moral and juridical responsibility, and that therefore the possibility of the Christian life is necessarily destroyed. Holy Mother Church grieves over the facts and causes from which the views mentioned proceed and is striving with all her might to remove them. She strongly desires that pastoral theologians, along with experts in medicine, psychology, and sociology, join their forces to work for a better understanding of the causes of the evils and to remove them by appropriate remedies. Indeed, the same Mother Church is not unaware that these opinions arise from a certain incautious zeal. If responsibility is taken away, so is formal offense to God, and the danger to eternal life. But the Apostle already rebuked a zeal that is not according to knowledge. See Romans chapter 10 verse 2. It should be noted, moreover, that it is one thing for freedom to be lessened, and another for it to be taken away. Take it away, and man is deprived of his dignity, and the glory of God is obscured. 25. A Defense of Human Dignity Against False Measures In its defense of human freedom, the Holy Church also takes care that whatever is opposed to it be excluded from the practice of morality. Even those who exercise public or judicial authority or supervise the preparation of trials are never permitted, either themselves or through others, to use physical, chemical, or psychological means that are opposed to the dignity of the human person and the preservation of his bodily and mental integrity. 
No one, moreover, is permitted to subject himself unconditionally and indiscriminately to psychiatric clinics, nor to surrender himself to physicians who advise the ill to use means that are opposed to Catholic precepts. 26. Science, Liberal Arts, Technology the dignity of the human person is displayed in a singular way not only in the divine sonship and participation in the d divine nature, but also in the fact that man has been created by God above the work of his hands, and is therefore said by the psalmist to be little less than the angels. See Psalms chapter 8 verses 6 to 7. Therefore the Holy Synod is joyfully aware that the church has always thought highly and favorably of science and the liberal arts, not only because in many ways they serve the glory of God, and promote the salvation of souls, but also because of their very nature they are certainly representative of the divine knowledge and beauty. It has an equally high regard for the so-called exact sciences and for technology. Since God in the beginning gave man the command to lord it over all things, see Wisdom chapter 9 verse 2, collated with Genesis chapter 1 verses 28 to 30, the efforts by which men probe the secrets of nature and strive more and more to turn the immense powers of nature to the good of humanity are in themselves praiseworthy. But such inquiry, by such inquiry, many advantages are gained for the progress of human life, and technology, if used properly, can with the help of grace lead to God. Indeed, it can and should help to spread Christian doctrine and to increase the glory of God. That is why every effort should be made that things which God dis destined for his glory and for men's temporal happiness not be disfigured by a human pride that attributes to man's genius what should be attributed to God, and that they not serve the error and depraved passions of human nature, passions which, if they are subject to right reason, help man to progress greatly in the way of the true and of the good. 27. Technological Progress and the Kingdom of God it is also wicked and contrary to faith to maintain that the tremendous progress in human civilization, which can be achieved by the exact sciences and technology, is the same thing as the spread of the kingdom of God on earth. For profane human civilization, however exalted, does not constitute the earthly kingdom of God, but ought in its own way to serve this kingdom. Indeed, to the degree that this civilization grows in accord with or contrary to the law of the gospel, it can similarly serve the increase or decrease of the kingdom of God. In its own way, it should, be, it should entirely serve it. For all things are Christ's and God's, and all things are to be restored in Christ. See Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. They are not to be restored in the same way. For sacred things, such as the grace by which we are made, shares in the divine nature, see Second Peter for chapter 1, verse 4, the sacraments and other similar things are fully and immediately related to the eternal life to which we are called. Profane things, however, are not ordered immediately to the kingdom of God, to the life of grace and glory, but can and should be related to them by the just man. Indeed, they should in their own way serve the kingdom of God. Chapter 28, Technological Progress and Progress in Religion and Morality. It is quite foreign to the church's mind to say that Christians, because of their love and hope for eternal things, cannot esteem temporal goods as they should, and that they labor under a certain false indifferentism with regard to physical evils, sorrows, hunger, and war. Quite the contrary, the church has always taught that grace presupposes nature, and that generally it cannot fruitfully fulfill its supernatural task, where the social conditions are lacking that really corresponds to the dignity of man, created in the image of God. On the other hand, it is not true that progress in technology, the exact sciences, and human civilization of its very nature, implies an equal progress also in the moral and religious field. If things that should serve the kingdom of God instead favor its adversaries, this must be attributed to that threefold evil concupiscence of which St. John the Apostle speaks. See 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. That is why many expect salvation from man rather than from God and from Christ, even among Christians, there are some who are more occupied with earthly things, and long more for them than for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See Philippians chapter 3, verses 19 to 20. They should be reminded again and again of those exhortations. If you have been raised with Christ, seek what is above. Think of what is above, not of what is on earth. See Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. Thank you for listening. Have a blessed Saturday.